England's king, Henry VIII, is famous for many things. And practically all of them have something to do with his six wives. The story of Anne of Cleves fascinates many people in particular. Henry rejected her because he thought she was too ugly. A portrait of his court painter Hans Holbein the Younger actually shows a beautiful young woman. Henry was also very good friends with her later in life. There is therefore no shortage of speculation as to why Henry might have rejected her in the first place, especially since at that time he himself no longer looked like a gift to the world of women. A common speculation is that he was offended by her that Anne had not recognized him when they first met, he had disguised himself and supposedly hoped that she would identify him anyway, and so a true love story would begin. I think there is another possibility. Perhaps Henry only rejected Anne because his heart still was with another woman who was out of reach for him at that time, Catherine Willoughby. However, her story is completely different than you might think. She has been the subject of two books in the last 10 years. Kelly Hart called her work The Seventh Wife. David Baldwin gave his book the title Henry VIII's Last Love. Both titles hinted it. They named Catherine as a candidate to replace Catherine Parr, who was about to be arrested in 1546. By the way, I'm so sorry that all the names are so similar, but I can't help it. Back to the topic. However, she may have been a serious candidate in Henry's eyes when he was looking for a replacement for his third marriage, Jane Seymour. The king at least supposedly sought solace from her, but first things first. Catherine was born on March 22th, 1519 or 1520, so she was considerably younger than the Tudor king, and this was to become apparent shortly after her birth. Her father, Baron William Willoughby, was very popular with Henry and his then-wife Catherine of Aragon. The queen was her godmother. She was named after her. So there is a good chance that Henry had hold one of his possible wives as a baby, which makes me quite uncomfortable. The godmother's influence was not enough to convince Catherine Willoughby of the Catholic cause in the long term. She was a staunch Protestant and made no secret of it. In addition, she was endowed with an extremely sharp tongue and loved to insult the powerful. For example, she dressed her dog in a white bishop's robe and named him after the arch-conservative bishop Stephen Gardner, whom she despised particularly intensely. She liked to utter her insults in front of an audience. Henry is said to have found these character traits quite attractive, as he had a weakness for strong women. However, Catherine, who was the only surviving child of her parents, had already married Charles Brandon in 1533. She was 13 or 14. Her new husband was approaching 50. Before their marriage, he was her legal guardian. Originally, Catherine was supposed to marry a son of Charles, but he was only 10 years old in 15. 33. And Charles' previous wife, Mary Tudor, the king's sister, had died. The couple had two sons, but they died in their teens. We have a note from the imperial ambassador Eustace Chapieux to Charles V about the wedding. On Sunday next, the Duke of Suffolk will be married to the daughter of a Spanish lady named Lady Willoughby. She was promised to the Duke's son, but he is only 10 years old. And although it is not worth writing to your majesty, the novelty of this case made me mention it. Catherine's mother, Donna Marina de Salinas, was one of the ladies-in-waiting of Catherine of Aragon and had traveled with her from Spain to England. At the time of the wedding, Henry was still fully fixated on Anne Boleyn and was not interested. Later, however, she was out of reach from due to this marriage. She was married to his brother-in-law and had taken the place of his deceased sister. Even as a king, he couldn't just ignore this. This brings us to the year 1538. Jane Seymour had died 
the previous year after the birth of Edward VI, and Henry sought solace from Catherine as Eustace Chapieu once again tells us he was masking and visiting the 18 or 19 year old in March 1538. He also gave her gifts during this time which she gratefully accepted. However, this practice had already begun on New Year's Day 1534 and was probably above all the sign of respect for her as Brandon's new wife. For her part, she is also said to have sought proximity to Thomas Cronwell in order to strengthen her own position. Catherine had already given birth to her two sons in 1538. This fact had undoubtedly not escaped Henry's attention. Moreover, she was a regular visitor to the court, so he knew her very well. Henry delayed marrying Anne of Cleves until 1540. It seems perfectly logical that he must have been very interested in marrying Catherine, but simply couldn't find a way to do so. Baldwin is convinced that Henry would have made her his queen in, the, in an instant if she had been single. Offense of what if? This is a worthwhile scenario. When Henry was married to Catherine Parr, he could have actually taken her as his wife. Brandon had died on August 22th, 1545, so that obstacle was out of the way, and supposedly there were considerations in this regard when the queen challenged her husband too much with her staunch Protestantism. In John Fox we can read that Henry seriously considered having her charged with treason and heresy. One of Henry's agents in Antwerp even reported the following home in March 1546. This day came to my lodging a merchant of this town saying that he had dined with certain friends of whom offered to lay a wager with him that the king's majesty would have another wife and he prayed me to show him the truth. He would not tell me who offered the wager and I said that I have never heard of any th such thing and there was no such thing. Many folks talk of this matter and from whence it comes, I cannot learn. The imperial ambassador, François van der Draft, wrote similar things home to Charles V in February 1546, mentioning an evergreen in Henry's life, the desire for another son. Sire, I am confused and apprehensive to inform your majesty that there are rumors here of a new queen although I do not know why or how true it may be. Some people attribute it to the sterility of the present queen, while others say there will be no change whilst the present war lasts. Madame Suffolk is much talked about and is in great favor, but the king shows no alteration in his demeanor towards the queen, though the latter, as I am informed, is somewhat annoyed at the rumors. With Madame Suffolk, Catherine is even mentioned by name here. But why didn't it come to a new wedding? According to Baldwin and Hart, there are probably three reasons for this. First, Catherine Parr managed to reconcile with the king. Second, Henry knew that he would have had similar problems with Catherine Willoughby as he did with his current wife, probably even more intensely. A sharp tongue and delight in insulting the powerful made her attractive to Henry. However, this did not make her a good queen in Henry's eyes, quite the opposite. Catherine had avoided the court in the days of Anne of Cleves and Catherine Howard. She had returned under Catherine Parr and was even part of the queen's household, seeing in her a kindred spirit on the question of Protestantism. Third, Henry was in the final stages of his life and was visibly tired. He lacked the will to go through all the effort that would have been involved in another change of his wife's. And I'm sorry that I call it another change of his wife's, but I really thought about it and I just can't think about a better expression. Catherine's life remained adventurous even after the death of the Tudor king. Under Edward VI, after the death of Catherine Parr and the execution of Thomas Seymour, she became the legal guardian of Mary, the couple's daughter, but was unable to provide for her financially. Parliament granted the baby her father's property 
but the child disappeared from history in 1550, despite continued speculation about her possible survival. Kathleen married Richard Bertie in 1553 for love, with whom she was to have two children. However, due to Mary's, now the daughter of Henry VIII, due to Mary's ascension to the throne, Catherine had to flee England. Not only was she a staunch Protestant, but she was also related to Lady Jane Grey through her stepdaughter Frances. And under adventurous circumstances, the escape succeeded. Under the pretext of collecting debts in Spain that Catherine's first husband still owed there, Richard Bertie managed to obtain permission from the Queen to leave the country. He left England in June 1554 and Catherine had to stay behind with her young daughter to keep up appearances. It was not until New Year's morning 1555 that she secretly followed him. Disguised as a merchant's wife, she left her estate in London between 4 and 5 o'clock in the morning, accompanied only by a few servants. As they tried to escape through the gate, however, a security guard heard the noise and while fleeing from him, Catherine lost all her luggage with her daughter's baby clothes. The royal council already knew of her escape when, shortly afterwards, she boarded a ferry in the harbour to Leigh, where the ship was waiting for her escape. The royal council therefore had her house searched. When she arrived at Leigh, they already knew about it as well, so she only went undetected because a merchant named Gosling passed her off as his grown-up daughter on a visit. It wasn't until a few days later that Catherine was finally able to board a ship bound for Holland. After being driven back to England twice by unfavorable winds and once even being inspected in search of her, she finally arrived safely in Brabant. The couple first found refuge in Wesel, which was located in the Duchy of Cleves, of all places, but Richard and Catherine couldn't stay here permanently. The Polish king invited them to his home when he heard that the couple was in danger. In April 1557, they began the long journey to Poland, but an incident occurred near Frankfurt that almost cost Richard Bertie his life. The Bertie's lapdog angered a group of the Count Palatine's passing gunmen to such an extent that they attacked the group. They thrust their lances into the wagon, carrying the women and children, and in the ensuing battle between them and Bertie's four mounted Man, the captain's horse was killed. By the time Bertie arrived, sent by his wife to get help in a nearby town, Bert had spread that the captain had been killed. Bertie was nearly lynched by his brother and an angry mob if he hadn't been able to find refuge in an attic via a ladder until the mayor and magistrate arrived and had him arrested. He was not released until the next day after the local count of Erbach cleared up the misunderstanding. They finally reached Poland safely, where the king not only gave them a warm welcome, but also entrusted Richard Bertie with the government of the province of Samabotia, which finally gave the Berties a secure income. Until Queen Mary's death, they lived safely and well cared for in Poland. After Mary's death, the couple was able to return to England under Elizabeth. Catherine's hope that her husband would receive her father's title Dashed. For this, her daughter's husband was made Earl of Kent. Her son became a successful commander of Elizabeth's army, however he had previously married, against Catherine's will, Mary de Vere, the sister of the Earl of Oxford. Catherine died in 1580. Her husband followed her two years later. The common grave in the church of Spilsby has been preserved to this day and can be visited. I thought it was the right thing to tell her story as a whole and not to end with Henry's death. Her life deserves it. Thanks for watching. And bye!